I walked through the door and knew immediately that something was wrong. The place was clean, gleaming, pine, polished chrome, clean for the first time in ages. Donna stood nervously in the hallway, dressed up, not to go all out, but not in her typical, lately sloppy fashion. Her hair was up and shiny, the kids were tangled underfoot, and not a sound could be heard in the house. Her face betrayed her guilt and nervousness. I was reminded of our early years, actually not that long ago. She never had much money as a child and went to school on loans, worked at a co-op, and used her summer earnings. She was very frugal. When we got married, I worked for two years and made a good living, almost $50,000 a year. I encouraged her to buy things she needed, and even things she didn't need but wanted. Every time she bought something for herself, she felt guilty and cleaned like crazy. The whole house, top to bottom, it was like she was punishing herself. Welcome to the Dark Side channel. Dive into the world of human relationships, mistakes, and right decisions. Don't miss out. Subscribe and join our growing community. It took me years to get out of that habit. The house looked the same again. Guilt. I imagine things might be back to normal soon, judging by the way things were going. My fears had risen dramatically over the past couple days when the worst of my fears were confirmed. A concerned friend brought the issue to the forefront after seeing my wife in an intimate embrace with another man. I began my preparations less than 48 hours ago. I had hoped for more time. By all accounts, this was one of the few scenarios I had foreseen. Confession and confrontation. I silently prayed that she wouldn't completely give in. Alan, she said anxiously, we need to talk. No preamble, no soft let in. Straight to the point. Too quickly almost, I had to act swiftly before she broke everything beyond repair. I shook my head, placed my briefcase on the floor and approached her. Later, I said quietly. She clasped her hands, her face flushed. Her hands trembled. I have to... Uh, she gasped as my fist surged forward, striking her abdomen with all the force I could muster. She doubled over, gripping my forearm, unable to breathe. I held her by the shoulders, keeping her from collapsing to the floor. I wanted her to stand. It would work better if she stood. About thirty seconds later, the first raspy breaths entered her lungs, and tiny cries of agony escaped her lips as she slowly regained the ability to breathe. I examined her, still captivated by her beauty. The tendons in her neck tensed, nostrils flared, mouth gaping wide in an attempt to draw in the life-giving air she so desperately needed. When her legs could support her again, she stood, swaying, one hand grasping the door frame, and her breathing evened out. She stared at me in shock and fear. Clearly, in her opinion, I would never even lift a finger against her. On the other hand, until this moment, there had never been a reason. I, on the other hand, remained calm, waiting for her. I, I can't believe you hit me, she finally whimpered. I didn't do anything like that. Did you want to say something? If not, why don't we have a drink? It's been a tense day. No, Alan, I can't live like this. I want... She screamed as the blow to her stomach lifted her off the ground. The breath was knocked out of her, leaving her gasping. Her frightened eyes looked at me as I lowered her to the ground on her back. Her lips opened and closed, desperately gasping for air. I straddled her and sat on her chest, lowering my weight, crushing her ribcage. My legs pinned her arms to her sides, and tears streamed from the corners of her eyes as the battle for oxygen slowly slipped away. I lifted slightly and heard a faint rush of air into her lungs. The wheezing, whistling sound returned her sight. The instant look of relief on her face vanished as I covered her mouth and nose with my hand, suffocating her. She struggled against it, writhing, shaking her head, but all in vain. I pressed against her chest and watched as the light faded from her eyes. I think she got the message. She was unconscious for about thirty seconds. Just enough time for me to lay her on the couch, her head resting on my lap. I didn't even need to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. She came to on her own. My wife of eight years suddenly sat up, gasping loudly, eyes wide open. She was clearly terrified. I embraced her and gently lowered her. I waited for her to regain her composure, 
Feeling the fear and trembling take over her body, tears streamed from her eyes as she turned them towards me. I wiped them away. Was there something you wanted to talk about, honey? I asked softly, stroking her cheek. I let my hand slide lower, encircling her long, slender neck. Her eyes met mine, nervous, questioning, assessing. Mine waited patiently. I didn't even tighten my grip. I... I made lasagna, she whispered. Beer or wine for dinner? Wine would be perfect, I replied. My hands started moving, rubbing and massaging her neck. I could see the glint of fear in her captivating green eyes. You know I love you more than anything in the world, don't you, Donna? She nodded cautiously. I would do anything for you. I would fight for you. I would die for you. I would gladly, without hesitation, kill for you. You mean so much to me. Her eyes filled with tears and she nodded again. I know. I lifted her up and hugged her tightly. You look awful, I whispered. Let's go to the bathroom and freshen up. Don't come out until you've freshened up. I escorted her to the master bedroom and led her into the bathroom. As soon as the door closed, I sprang into action. I wanted us to remain out of communication for at least a few hours. It took just 30 seconds to dash outside and disable access to the phone where it entered the house. That took care of the DSL internet as well. I found her purse in the kitchen where it usually lay and within minutes had her cell phone. I turned the ringer off so it would only vibrate and slipped it into my pocket. She was still in the bathroom. Feeling a little better about controlling the situation, I changed out of my work clothes. For a moment, I almost put on my sweatpants and old t-shirt as I did almost every evening. Instead, I chose Dockers and a nice polo shirt. She had dressed up for me. It was the least I could do. I fixed my hair, looking in the mirror above the dresser. I heard the door open and saw my wife nervously peek in, stealing herself before entering the bedroom. She flinched as I approached her with open arms. This evening started off rough, I said to her, drawing closer. I hugged her. Hey, baby. I'm so sorry I'm a little late. You look stunning. She cautiously embraced me, then a little tighter. You were only a few minutes late. Thanks for calling ahead. The lasagna is still warm, she said softly. Are the kids out? I left them with my parents. I... I thought we needed some time together. Alone. I released her and lifted her chin, gently kissing her lips. You're right. I think we both understand that things aren't perfect between us. I'd like to work on that. Work on it? She asked anxiously. Absolutely. I took her hand, leading her back to the living room. I'm starving. Let's eat, and maybe after dinner we can talk. Dinner was awkward. We talked about the kids and work, but little about what was going on in her life. We carefully avoided the elephant in the room. We opened a bottle of wine, but by the end of dinner, she was still only a third full. Twice during the meal, I felt her phone vibrating. I ignored it. When we finished, I stood up and collected the plates. Dinner was fantastic, as always. You're an amazing cook. I don't think I tell you that enough. Why don't you relax and I'll tidy up. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Donna thanked me, and I saw her dart into the kitchen as I went for the second round of plates. When I returned, she was standing by the table, placing her purse on it, looking flustered. I suspected she was looking for her phone. I have a kitchen, baby. Don't take it personally. I... I'm going to use the bathroom. I'll be right back. I saw that guilty, nervous look again. She'd make a lousy poker player. I knew she was likely headed for the phone in our bedroom. A surprise awaited the girl. I pulled her phone out of my pocket to check the call log. Her phone was password protected, but for the past couple of weeks I hadn't been sitting idle as soon as my suspicions arose, or better to say were uncovered. Her password was stupidly simple, the last four digits of her social security number. The last call was from Emily. As far as I knew, we didn't have any friends named Emily. I pressed redial, and a male voice answered with concern after just one ring. How did he take it? Run. If you know what's good for you, run and don't look back. I hung up. A few seconds later, she entered the living room, white as a sheet. I approached her and led her back to the dining table, seating her at the edge. I placed a glass of wine in front of her. Just wait a minute. There's something I need you to do for me before we talk, okay? She nodded calmly. She sat, hands folded in front of her, trying to steady her trembling. 
A minute later, I returned from the study and placed a piece of paper in front of her. I want you to read this. Think about it. Weigh the words carefully. I'll come back for you in ten minutes. During that time, all I want you to do is think about what it means to you. She looked at the paper, written with the words she spoke to me just over eight years ago. I, Donna, take you, Alan, to be my lawful husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, until death do us part. And here I pledge to you my faithfulness. When I returned to her after ten minutes, I saw that the words were smeared from her tears. She nervously looked at me. Let's go, I said to her, reaching out my hand. Let's sit in the living room. She obediently followed me. I knew the evening didn't go as she had planned. She was by no means a pushover and always ready to stand up for herself. Her actions or lack thereof spoke volumes about how my response had affected her. I sat next to her on the couch. Let me tell you how I feel about these words, honey. I consider it a contract of the highest order. You said them after much thought and preparation, pledging before God, our family, our friends, and each other. Do you agree? Yes, but, she whispered, shh, not yet, you'll have your turn. As far as I understand, it's very straightforward. There's only one condition for exit. From this, there's only one way out. One. It's all written very plainly. Can you tell me what the exit terms are? She fell silent, and I nudged her gently. Donna? What's the only way out? Until death do us part, she whispered. Exactly. I know that for almost a year now, things haven't been perfect. I don't quite understand why. I'd be willing to work on it. I can't do it alone. I need to know if you want to exercise your exit clause. No, she quickly replied. Are you sure? I wouldn't want to do that, but I'm prepared to go through with that option if you feel it's come to that. Please, Alan. No. Her voice gave her away, stuttering, almost pleading. It hurt me to scare her like this, but I felt it was necessary if there was any chance of saving our marriage. Excellent. Today, I can swear to you that I've never violated this contract. I love you and cherish you, though perhaps I haven't always shown it as well as I should have. Fortunately, it's been for better, for richer, and mostly in health. Wouldn't you agree? She nodded. Yes, mostly. I've been faithful to you 100% since this contract was made. I've never been with another woman. Maybe I've been tempted and even behaved in ways I might be ashamed of, but I've never had a relationship with anyone else but you. Can you say the same? I saw the fear return to her eyes. She hesitated. I... I've made some bad choices, Alan, some of which I'm ashamed of now, but I've never been with another man since dedicating myself to you. Do you believe me? I took her hand in mine. I do. If I thought otherwise, I might have been tempted to break the contract. Do you understand? She nodded nervously. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'd like you to tell me now what you were thinking while sitting there and rereading our contract. What does it mean to you? It's difficult, she said. I know. It's been hard for me, too, these past few months, seeing you willingly ignore it. Please tell me. When I said those words, I meant them wholeheartedly. You were the best thing that ever happened to me, and I couldn't imagine life without you. I think we had about five or six absolutely wonderful years, then a couple that were good but not straightforward. Over the past six months, I... I forgot. Forgot what was important. I started to think that maybe life could be better. She hesitated, breathing unevenly. God... I'm so sorry, Alan. I don't know how I even thought that, but I pictured life without you. If you were unhappy, Donna, why didn't you tell me? Work on making our marriage better instead of sabotaging it. You need to understand that there are only two people fighting for our marriage, you and me. There will always be those whose goal is to undermine it for a variety of reasons. Jealousy, lust, envy, just to name a few. It's only you and me, a team who should fight for this. I can't do it alone. I never thought about it that way, she said. Do you remember how we made this contract? She sadly smiled at me. I do. It was wonderful. I can't believe I ever forgot, even for a moment. 
I would like to reaffirm our contract and assure it once again. Could you do that with me? It's been almost five weeks since we last confirmed it. How? Has it really been that long? Tomorrow marks five weeks, the longest time since we've been married. I'm sorry, she whispered. Shh. Let's forget about that for now. Will you come with me to our bedroom and reaffirm it once again? Do you still want me to do that, after tonight? More than anything in the world, she smiled. Could you give me a couple of minutes to prepare myself? Of course. We lay together naked after making love for the first time in a very long time. Love, commitment, and reaffirmation of our love. We reaffirmed our commitments twice from my side, several more times from hers. We ended with me holding her as she cried, clinging to me. When her tears subsided, I climbed back onto her, amazed at how readily my body responded to her after the stress of that evening. Deeply buried inside her, I kissed her face. I'm sorry I let this come between us. I never wanted that. You mean the world to me. You do too. I... I love you, Alan. I'm so, so sorry. You've given me an amazing life and two beautiful children. A better life than I ever thought possible all those years ago. I almost ruined it all, didn't I? Too close for comfort. I'm sorry for hurting you. I couldn't let you say words that could have torn our contract apart. I couldn't do it. I had to stop you. Please forgive me. The corner of her mouth lifted slightly. God, it hurts. I still can't believe you hit me. It still hurts. She looked shaken again. Do I even want to know what would have happened if I'd gone through with it? I sadly shook my head. She nodded in response. Thank you for giving us another chance. We're not doing enough of that, she said, her hand caressing my side. I know. I regret that too, I replied. What happens now? She asked, her hand still gently stroking my side. I had thought a lot about this. Relationships between a man and a woman are much like a house, I explained. Some people get apartments. They're temporary, not very invested in it. They move out after a year and get a new one. Marriages are like houses. You invest money into it. You dedicate yourself to it. You work to make it a home. In a good marriage, both spouses do everything they can to maintain the home, improve it, keep it in order. We had a wonderful home that our friends and family envied, but we allowed it to fall into disrepair. We didn't do the repairs, didn't make any effort to improve it. It became stale and a bit worn. I'm as guilty of this as you are, if not more. I regret it, and will work to ensure it doesn't happen again, I said. I leaned in and gently kissed her soft lips. I believe that at some point, certain external forces thought it would be fun to undermine our home, tear down the walls, put up barriers between us. They wanted you out of our home and into a new one. I don't know if it was an apartment, a condominium, or a mansion. All I know is that it wouldn't have been ours anymore, I continued. I don't think it was like that, she said softly, nervously. Maybe they just wanted to help fix my side a little. There's no your side and my side. This is our home. It wasn't some handyman we hired to make things better. It was a damn thief, an enemy, I said, feeling a surge of anger rising within me, and I struck deep into Donna's pliable depths. He wanted to steal my woman, mine. I need a name, Donna. Barbarians are at the gate. I need to defend it. I continued. What are you going to do? She nervously asked, her body trembling. Protect our home. Make sure they never try to tear it down again. I replied. Can't we just move on, Alan? I'll make sure it's over. She pleaded. No, I can't trust you yet. You betrayed us. You invited them in. You unlocked the gates. I'm going to slam them shut. A name, Donna. Gerald. Gerald Witten. The name I'd never heard before. Thank goodness none of our friends. I leaned over her, my face inches from hers. I'm angry with you, my love. So deeply angered. This would never have happened if you hadn't opened the gates, betrayed our marriage. You were a traitor, allowing someone else to interfere. It will be a long time before I can fully trust you to be the sole protector of our marital home. Do you understand? She nervously nodded. I never wanted this to happen. I'm sorry. Forgiven, I whispered reaching out to gently stroke her cheek. Forgiven, but not forgotten, not yet. What are you going to do? 
she asked again. First here with you, rebuild the walls. Right now, I'm closing the gates. After that, I'll deal with the invaders. That's all you need to know. I fell silent and pinned my wife down. We didn't make love. It was rough, almost vicious. Yet she responded, calling out to me before I finished. We lay together, both feeling a bit uneasy about how things stood. I pulled her closer. You won't talk to him, warn him, or anything like that. If he approaches you, push him away. If he persists, scream, fight, shout, whatever it takes. But don't engage in conversation. Call me if you can. Understand? There's no second chance. Yes. Shouldn't I tell him it's over? There's no need. I've already done that. Her eyes widened, and I felt a shiver of fear run through her. Be careful, she said softly. I smiled. Those words helped close the breach in many ways. Trust, but verify. The phrase, made famous by Ronald Reagan in his dealings with the Soviets, interestingly enough, was coined by Vladimir Lenin. Trust, but verify. I don't know why I found it so amusing. It became my new motto. The showdown began on Friday. Saturday morning we reaffirmed our contract, and it was almost like turning back time by eight years. Almost. I tasked my wife with picking up the kids, and for the first time this season, I skipped out on a football match. Time was still of the essence, and there were things that needed to be done. Loading the software onto her smartphone took less than an hour. Stolen gold for the iPhone. It wasn't cheap, well over $100 for six months' access, but it allowed me to track everything she did, including remotely activating her GPS and monitoring her movements. I could read her messages and call logs. I had the ability to record her calls and even if I wished, secretly call and eavesdrop on her conversations. It was practically undetectable. Technology had come a long way. For another $80, I had full access to her computer, email, chat logs, web history, keylogger and the like. I was surprised at how easy it was. The 30-minute round trip to the store resulted in the acquisition of a recording device connected to the phone jack and my computer. It recorded and logged all phone calls, including voicemail messages, and saved them on the computer in digital format. It also tracked the caller ID, time, and length of the messages. I purchased a GPS recorder slash tracker while I was there for about $180. It didn't do everything I wanted. I wouldn't have lived GPS tracking, but I could download complete histories of all her travels. That should be enough. I ordered the best one online, with live tracking, but didn't want to wait for it to arrive. I had to wait until she returned home and install it under the hood. It required 12V power instead of batteries. It also had a 1G BSD card that I had access to in order to view the logs. I bought a spare memory card so I could swap them out while I analyzed them. In total, it was nearly $400, but it was much cheaper than hiring a private detective or the cost of a divorce. I downloaded Donna's old call and message history from her phone. When she returned from the game, I received excited news from the kids while she fed them lunch. After they finished eating, I pulled her aside to have some privacy. I handed her the phone. I have your call history. I want you to remove it from your phone. No more hiding it under Emily. Who have you been talking to about these affairs? They weren't affairs, she began. Don't start lying now, Donna. I have no patience for it. We need to move forward. Every lie, every deceit sets us back two steps, another crack in the foundation of our home. Now tell the truth. Who knows about this? She blushed. Karen and Lisa. I sighed. Damn it, Donna. You're not making it easier for me. They're both accomplices in this betrayal. She shook her head firmly. Not Lisa. I swear she fought me every step of the way. Please call her, she'll tell you the truth. I nodded. She's your sister, so I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. I'll talk to her. As for Karen, she's treated just like that bastard. She's cut off. No more relationship whatsoever. No, Alan, you can't do that. She's been my best friend since college. I'll make it easier for you, Donna. You can cut her off or I'll do it. If I do it, I promise you'll never see or hear from her again. Ever. If you do it, there's a chance for reconciliation in the future. Minimal, but possible. Your choice. Why are you so harsh and cold about this? So threatening? This isn't like you. You're not that person. Anger tinged her voice. 
That only fueled my anger even more. This is me. It's in me. The part I keep away from you because I loved you so much. I sheltered you. I can be tough and even cruel if needed. It's important that you understand. Right now, we're not a team defending our marriage anymore. I'm in control of everything. It'll all be done my way. There's no other way. Deviating from my rules will mean complete and total war from my side. No prisoners, absolute and merciless destruction. This is the most important thing in the world to me, and I'll exert all the powers I possess or control to make sure I get it. Alan, you're scaring me, she whispered. Fair enough. Now, as I've said, end it with Karen. You get one call to break it off. I never want to hear about her again. I'll know if you don't. I reserve the right to check your phone and email whenever I want. You've lost my trust, and until you earn it back, you're under scrutiny. In fairness, you can check my phone and email, too. I have nothing to hide. What about Lisa? I'll talk to her. If all goes well, she can be your confidant. You can talk to her about anything. I'll let you know by the end of the weekend. Where do we go from here, Alan? I feel like I've already lost you. You don't trust me and you're spying on me. I'm afraid of you. We talk. We open up. We discuss what went wrong and how we can fix it. We don't rush to patch up the cracks in our relationship. We're renovating our home. At some point, you lost respect for me. If you don't respect me, damn it, you'll fear me. I'll spend a lot of time and effort to earn back your respect while you work on rebuilding trust. We make it a priority in our lives. I never lost respect for you, she objected. Your actions suggest otherwise. What if that's not enough? She asked. That's not an option. You don't want to know what will happen if you break our contract. That's all I have to say about it. There won't be another chance. I... I didn't break it, you know. You have to believe me. I thought about it, but I wouldn't have done it while we were still married. I know. That's why we're giving this a second chance. I know a lot more than you think. How much? She asked. You'll never find out. A lot. Let's just leave it at that. But how? I said you'll never find out. Let it go, Donna. Be glad you ended it before it went too far. I referred to her as my older sister, Lisa. We had a long heart-to-heart -heart talk. Donna was honest. Lisa was adamantly against what she was doing and was on the verge of telling me until it went too far. I involved her in my plan, at least to some extent. I asked her to be Donna's confidant moving forward and help her get back on the straight and narrow. Why did you stop it? If she wanted out, why not kick her to the curb? Lisa asked. I love her. She's the mother of my children. She made a mistake, and we caught her before it went too far. I'd rather fight for my marriage and my wife than let someone else steal her away from me. If I kicked her to the curb, that would be ugly. I don't believe in rewarding treacherous bitches and predators. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure she and that bastard pay dearly, very dearly if necessary. You wouldn't harm her, would you? Ask her. She knows. She seemed unsettled. I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of you, would I? No, you definitely wouldn't. On the other hand, I'm very loyal and grateful to those on my side. I can't thank you enough for trying. I owe you, Lisa. Let's fix your damn marriage, knock some sense into her thick head, and we'll call it even. I chuckled. Hardly. I'll owe you even more. I'm fine with being in your debt. I'll gladly take all the help you can offer us. She's my younger sister, Alan. I'll help, but if she screws up, I won't be the one to tell you. I understand. Let's try to make sure she doesn't, okay? She nodded. It was good to have understanding and an ally. The conversation with Karen's husband, Jerome, didn't go quite as smoothly. He met me at the Dubliner, our local bar, where I bought him a beer. What's going on, Alan? You've never invited me for a drink before. I'm afraid it's a first and last. Your wife was involved in wrecking my marriage. I put a stop to it. She's not allowed to interfere in our lives in any way anymore. Unfortunately, that includes you. It's a shame. I like you, Jerome. Unfortunately, your wife is a treacherous adulteress. I saw him getting angry, his face reddening. Stop damn well insulting my wife. Donna was on the verge of an affair. Karen was egging her on. I know that for sure. I was warned by a friend, a true friend, unlike your wife. I checked into it. I have evidence and a confession from my wife. Apparently, Karen thinks infidelity in marriage is normal. I don't share that opinion, and I won't let anyone who does interfere in our lives. 
I just thought it fair you know where we stand when we're crossing you two off our list. What kind of evidence? He asked, simmering slowly. That's none of your concern. Donna stopped. The bastard who tried to seduce her will pay dearly. Anyone who aided will pay too. I'm giving you fair warning. Karen helped. I don't believe you. You don't need to. It won't change my stance one bit. She's my enemy now. You have a choice. Leave on your own or try to defend her. Either way, she must pay. What the hell? Are you threatening me? I sighed. I did this out of courtesy, Jerome. Like I said, I've always liked you. Consider this a warning. You have a little time, not much. Then the hammer comes down. I handed him a list. Surveillance tools. If you want to learn more about the woman you married, use them. Or don't. It doesn't matter to me. I stood up and left dollar twenty on the bar. It was nice catching up with you. If you decide to cut ties with her for good, let me know. I'll try to spare you the consequences. He looked at me as if I had a third eye. I... I don't believe you. Yes, you'll find out. Just wait and see, and stay out of this. I called work and took a few days of emergency leave. I agreed to check my email and handle any serious issues that arose, but I wouldn't be in the office for at least three days, maybe a week. I started rebuilding my relationship with my wife. Small gestures, notes, one single flower, tiny pieces of jewelry. I invited her out to dinner. I complimented her. I expressed interest in making love to her every night, and she responded in kind. She didn't know I had taken time off from work. Every morning I left the house at the usual time and worked on my plan. It all started with a bit of reconnaissance, finding out where he lived from public records and tracking his car, a two-year-old Sebring. I followed him from his house to work, hardly worrying about him recognizing me. I definitely had never seen him before. On Tuesday, I placed a GPS tracker on his car, ordered by mail with a paid service plan for real-time monitoring, and received up-to-date information about his whereabouts. When I returned home that evening, at the usual time, I not only knew where he lived, but also where he worked, where he went, and what he was up to. I even managed to insert a micro-recorder into his car, which I could listen to while he was in the car. I could download conversations or even remotely activate the microphone and listen. From my wife's computer I sent him an email. I tried to use the same words and tone she had used in her previous contacts with him. Dear Jerry, it's over. I was wrong to entertain your advances. Please don't try to contact me again. I am married and want to restore my marriage. Please accept this letter as a gesture of friendship. I will fondly remember our time together, but it's over. Please, if you truly care about me, don't make this any more complicated than it already is. Donna. The attachment was an executable file. Clicking on it launched a simple slideshow of four photos of my wife. None of them were particularly explicit. The simple program also installed software on his computer. It was damn illegal. That night, I managed to download his email history, web history, passwords, and other useful content. Another dollar eighty well spent. On Wednesday, I analyzed the reconnaissance data I had collected. The information was alarming but not particularly surprising. Donna had deleted her emails, but this idiot had kept them all. I was able to read through six months' worth of his slow, deliberate efforts to win her over, playing on her emotions, bolstering her, tearing us apart. She was beautiful, sensual, intelligent, perplexing. I was cold, controlling, unloving, and almost certainly deceiving her. He was good at it, slowly gaining her trust. It was interesting how they met. Karen introduced him at a church volunteer event. Our damn church. What a slimy way to pick up women. Karen wasn't just a mediator, she was an instigator. Damn, she needed to pay. It turned out that this bastard was a serial seducer. My wife wasn't his only target. He was still in touch with two previous conquests and had set his sights on another one. He was married with one child to a woman who didn't understand him. At least that's what he said. Who was too busy with her job to give time to her family. She was cold and heartless. Over time, he painted her in a less than flattering light, bit by bit. I was sure his wife knew nothing about his inclinations. To his computer, I was painting a clear picture of this scumbag predator. This was going to be too easy. 
I decided to spend half a day at work on Thursday to catch up on things. Donna woke up when I did and made me breakfast. She sat beside me, sipping her coffee. She had almost a whole week to stew. I was an idiot, Alan. I don't know how I let this happen. Looking back on my actions now, I feel like I've become a different person. I don't like the person I've become. I nodded. You were seduced by an expert. You were hardly his first conquest, and he's already on to the next one. She reached under her robe and handed me her phone. He tried to contact me. When I ignored his texts and didn't answer his calls, he showed up here yesterday insisting I talk to him. I... I needed to talk to him. I told him it was over, and I never wanted to see him again. I threatened to call the police if he didn't leave. I handed her phone back without looking at it. I know, just after one o'clock. Thank you for telling me. He won't bother you anymore. I knew he had stopped by the house from the GPS tracking. I didn't know the rest, but I was content enough to let her believe I did, keep her off balance and maintain the illusion of omniscience. Please, don't do anything foolish, Alan. He's not worth it. I'll be careful. Just stay away from him. Tell me about your conversations with Karen and Lisa, I said again, pretending I already knew. I told Karen that she nearly cost me my marriage, and I won't have anything to do with her anymore. She wasn't too happy about it. I also called all of our mutual friends and made sure they understood that I don't want to associate with her anymore, and if she's invited to any events, I won't be attending. I told them that I value my marriage and she was ready to destroy it. I don't think we'll have to worry too much about seeing her around. You don't want to explain how she was involved in your encounter with that bastard? I calmly asked. You know? She stared at me in surprise. Then she shook her head. Of course you know. You knew everything. Why didn't you stop me, Alan? You should have stopped me. No, Donna. If I had interrupted you too soon, you wouldn't have believed me. I've already lost your respect. You needed to decide for yourself that it was wrong. That was the only way I could trust you. Only then could everything come full circle again. Unfortunately, you didn't do that. I intervened only at the last moment, when your next move would have destroyed what we had. I couldn't let that happen. I love you and our daughters too much to subject them to what I would have been forced to do. She looked visibly upset. I'm sorry. I know you're probably tired of hearing it. I swear, I didn't even foresee this. He was just a friend when I needed one. Someone to talk to, someone to relate to. He was kind to me, understanding. Of course he was. He wanted to sleep with you, wanted to cuckold me, take you away, use and discard you like he did with others. He wanted to tear down our home. You're a smart woman, Donna. How could you not see that? I... I don't know. He seemed like the perfect gentleman, and Karen kept assuring me that I wasn't doing anything wrong. It's normal to have friends, men with a different perspective. Even the first time he kissed me, it felt like a kiss from a cousin. Friendly. Nothing more. I don't know how I let this continue to escalate. Y'all opened the gates. The first time you shared intimacy, talked about your feelings about yours and mine's relationships, you let him in. He enjoyed making you talk about it, didn't he? She nodded. But he always supported me. He wanted to help me. Make our marriage stronger. Make me feel better. I hope you've learned your lesson. You gotta understand, Donna, that strange men don't want to become friends to help you. They want to get with you make you their plaything. The slicker ones might want to take you in. Guys like your guy want to use you and toss you aside. That's how they get their kicks. It was a painful lesson, she confessed softly. It's still hard to believe. He seems so nice. Enough of that bastard and Karen, his accomplice in crime. I'll deal with them. What about Lisa? Two long conversations. She chewed me out, but good. She says I got lucky, I agree. She's a good girl. I never realized it before. I'm sorry I didn't make more effort to get to know her better. I'm glad she's in your life. She looked excited. I want to ask you something, she finally said. Anything you want. Ask me anything. I want you to feel like you can talk to me about anything. I have too much free time. I'd like to do something to keep myself occupied. Both kids will be in school next semester. I'm thinking about getting a job or at least doing some volunteer work. That's a great idea. 
We don't need the money, so that shouldn't be a problem. You can find a job if you want, continue your education, or volunteer. I'll support you in whatever you choose to do. You're a smart woman. I'm sure you'll succeed in whatever endeavor you choose. It'll be a part-time job. Hopefully just while the kids are in school. I don't want anything to interfere with what we have going on. Okay. If you need any help with anything, job hunting, recommendations, resumes, anything, just let me know. She stood up and hugged me. You do love me, don't you? I would hope you wouldn't even have to ask, sweetheart. You mean everything to me. I'm sorry I started forgetting that. I'm going to make it up to you. You'll never have to worry about me again, I promise. I know. I'm willing to take some of the blame myself. I haven't been actively nurturing the vibrant love between us. I haven't been keeping our home in order like I should have. That's one mistake I won't allow to happen again. I love you, Alan. Thank you. I love you too. On the same day, I hired professional help. I had hoped to avoid it, but the information found on the bastard's computer demanded it. It wasn't cheap, costing me dollar two thousand, but it was quick. By Friday morning, I had the results. I was ready to start my game. Public libraries are a great thing. Computers are free to use and mostly unprotected. Within 20 minutes of sitting down, I plugged in my USB and installed an anonymous private VPN service. That bastard was careless enough to leave his credit card information on his computer, and he paid for the service. I felt like I covered my tracks as well as I needed to. His emails regarding his past conquests, along with some very incriminating photos, were sent to their spouses as well as to them. The full story of his ongoing seduction was relayed to the hapless husband, including information about his past successes. GPS locations outlined the sleazy lunches and the planned future rendezvous. The soon-to-be cuckold was informed of the place, date, and time. One of the women he was involved with worked with him in the same company. She no longer worked in the same building, but that didn't change anything. His email contact list was filtered to retrieve all company emails, and all his colleagues were included in a very informative message about his activities with the colleague and everyone else he was involved with. All client contacts extracted from his emails were notified about the type of person he was, in detail, with photos. This was just the beginning. Donna was dressed as I had asked. The kids spent the night with her sister, and I invited her out to dinner and dancing. She turned down several men who asked her to dance, spending time with me instead. I thought we mostly had a great time, but she seemed distracted. At the end of the evening on the way home, she turned on the radio. This has started, hasn't it? That's right. He must have called home in my phone at least a dozen times. He left several frantic text messages. He's blaming me. Sorry, I'll make sure he stops. Hopefully, after this weekend, you won't have to hear about him ever again. Will it get ugly? Maybe. For him. I've done everything I can to shield you from this. Oh, God, I really messed up, didn't I? Yes. Water under the bridge now. Did you have a good time tonight? She nodded, her hand stroking my shoulder. I did. I should have talked about it sooner. It's been distracting. I keep thinking about it. Please trust me. Don't be afraid to ask anything. Worst case, I'll explain why I won't tell you. I genuinely believe that our lack of communication over the past couple of years has been our biggest problem. I know. It's better now, isn't it? I think so. It's getting better. There's still a lot to work through, but I believe things are improving. We should do this more often. We need to find time just for you and me. I want that. Can we do it once a week? Time just for the two of us? I don't see why not. I enjoy being alone with you. Really? Truly? You need to stop doubting my feelings for you, Donna. I love you. I always have. I never will stop. Maybe I haven't been successful in expressing it and I regret that. I'll strive to do better. Are you going to show me that tonight? She teased. Again and again if you'll let me. Let you? I'll insist on it. Take me home, darling. I've been wet for you since we left the house tonight. We lay together, embracing each other, in the delightful afterglow. I held her, and she held me tight. I love this feeling, she said softly. So do I. Trust me, she chuckled, snuggling her back against me. Oh, I know. She paused for a moment. I need this, Alan. This time together afterward. 
Cuddles and hugs. Sometimes quickies are good, but we've lost that. Intimacy. It means as much to me as it does to you. I thought about it and realized she was right. We were in a rut. Intimacy was almost on a schedule, and then I'd quickly kiss her goodnight and try to get some sleep. I'm sorry, I whispered. I didn't notice the gradual changes, but now that you've mentioned it, I'm almost ashamed I didn't. I took you for granted. So did I. You were so kind to me, but I expected it rather than appreciated it. I've always loved you, but I think I reached a point where I wasn't in love with you anymore. You were my husband, provider, and father of my children, but you weren't my lover anymore. She turned to me, pressing her face against mine, slipping her leg between mine, drawing closer. She kissed my neck. We used to talk in bed, about everything and anything. We talked about our dreams, our goals, our fantasies. It was the most precious part of our relationship, that shared time, and it slipped away. I don't even remember how or why, but it stopped. She held me tighter, and I realized she was crying. Don't let us lose it again. I pulled her closer, enveloping her in my arms. She felt so small, so fragile. I kissed the top of her head. Never again, sweetheart, I promise. She remained in my embrace until she fell asleep. Even then, I didn't want to let her go. For me, it was a breakthrough, a window into how everything had deteriorated and why. I felt like a complete idiot. An extra ten minutes of cuddling each night could have made such a difference. It was time for communication, just for the two of us. Intimacy and openness. Once, I let that slip away. Never again. I woke up early, leaving her a note. I checked the GPS monitor and found the car parked at a motel near the highway. I drove there, prepared for any surprises. I hoped it wouldn't be necessary. At 8.30 a.m., I knocked on the door. Gerald Witten was a big guy, and I suspect many women would appreciate his looks. What do you want? He asked. Never call Donna again. If I were you, I'd grab your balls and get out of town. If I ever see you again, you won't see anything anymore. I'll make sure you never mess with my wife or any other woman again. You're the bastard who set me up? He growled. I'd happily kick your ass and screw your woman. I smiled. Don't say I didn't warn you. So far I've been kind to you. I unbuttoned my jacket to reveal the Ruger LC9 in its holster. Leave her alone and disappear. This is your final warning. I wasn't surprised when the police showed up later that morning. They asked if I knew a Gerald Witten and if I threatened to kill him. I explained that I had heard he seduced several married women and was flirting with mine. I wanted him to leave her alone. I played them the recording of the conversation I had with him. I never threatened him with any physical harm. I told him to leave my wife alone or I would make sure he did. That's all there is to it. You didn't point a gun at him or threaten to kill him? I never brandished any weapon of any kind. I never threatened him. I told him to leave my wife alone. In fact, the only threat came from him. Would you mind if we had a copy of that recording? One of the officers asked. Not at all. If you come in, I'll make a copy. The universe works in strange ways. I had more plans to deal with this scumbag, but he decided to make it easier for me. The scumbag called home and yelled into the answering machine. You stupid assholes! You contacted the wrong guy! I'm gonna track you down, beat the shit out of you, and fuck your woman right in front of you! You'll pay for reaching out to me, you moron! Maybe I'll even have to mess around with your daughter while I'm at it. I hope you've got eyes in the back of your head, cause I'm coming for you. What an idiot. I had to wonder how my wife could ever see anything in him besides the crap packaged in a six foot two inch frame. I had a copy of the recording I made. I also made a copy of logs of dozens of calls he made in the past few days, including a record of his latest threat. Here's the recording officer, including a copy of the threat he just made. I want him to stop. I don't want him messing around with my daughter. She's only six years old. Can you do something about this? The senior officer nodded. You'll need to come down to the station. I'll file your complaint. I have no doubt the district attorney will take this very seriously. Isn't it satisfying when a plan comes together just as you intended? The kids were playing on the Wii when I let him in. Hey, Jerome, I'll be honest. I didn't expect to see you anytime soon. She cheated on me, Alan. 
I don't know how much or for how long, but my wife's been cheating. I'm sorry it's affecting your marriage. Come on in, have a seat, can I offer you a beer? Either that or something stronger. Whiskey on the rocks? That would be perfect. I approached my wife who was doing laundry. Who's here? She asked. Jerome. He found out Karen was cheating on him. Would you be so kind as to bring us both a glass of Johnny Walker Blue Label on the rocks? Whiskey? I think it's the least I can offer him considering I'm the one who got him to figure out what his wife was up to. She finished folding a towel. How much does he know? I'm not sure. I hope you can help shed some light on it. Me? But Alan, what she told me was strictly confidential. She was my best friend. Was being the operative word here. Two glasses, one more for yourself if you'd like, and then please join us. I... I'm not sure I can. It would be wrong, she hesitated. Would it be any worse than sleeping with your boyfriend Gerald? Losing your family, your children, living in fear, always looking over your shoulder? She looked at me intently, then shamefully cast her eyes down. You won't let me live this down, will you? Forgiven, but not forgotten. If you cover up for other people's deeds, you're only one step away from having your own, approving through inaction. You see that, don't you? Fine. Give me a minute, okay? She didn't seem happy about it, but I was confident she'd do what needed to be done. It was closer to five when she joined us, handing out drinks. She sat in the chair across from us, taking a sip of her own. Jerome looked a bit surprised to see her. Hi, Donna. Sorry to intrude on your Saturday, he said. No need to apologize, Jerome. I think it's partly my fault. I wasn't much of a friend. Please tell him, honey, everything. How long, how often, how much, everything you know, I urged her. It's bad. Are you sure you want to know? she asked, turning to our guest. I don't want to, but I need to. However you can help, I replied. She sighed, taking another sip. She's promiscuous, completely unrepentant. It's embarrassing to admit, but we joked about it. She was one of them in college and remained so throughout your entire marriage. I don't think more than a couple of months ever passed without her seeing someone. Even after we got married? On her bachelorette party and within a week of your return from the honeymoon, she had a few regular boyfriends and she didn't want to let them go. Two of them, until they both moved away about four years ago. Then a couple of times a week, often with both of them. Did she say why? She loves it. She enjoys engaging in group activities and she revels in it. That's what she said. But how? She's a stay-at-home mom. She has plenty of time to play. She always made sure to be home and put herself together before you came back. She almost never did it in your home. On those rare occasions when you were out of town, she went a little crazy. She loved telling me about it. I was the only one she could confide in because she knew I would never tell. After all, we were best friends. I could see him struggling to contain his anger. When did they move? She was in a bit of a slump for a while before finding new playmates. None of them seemed to last more than six months or so. She was selective and finding individual men who enjoyed group play was probably harder than she thought. I'm sorry, I have to tell you this. Did she ever try to involve you in this? I asked. Of course she did, for many years. I constantly reminded her that I was very happy in my marriage and lived vicariously through her adventures. I really didn't think much about how wrong it was. She always was like that. What are you going to do, Jerome? I asked. I don't have much choice, do I? The first thing I'm going to do is to see if these are my children, right? Donna spoke up. That's right. She has always been very careful about that. She may be frivolous, but she loves you, and only you. This will devastate her. That doesn't help me much, he said angrily. Is there any way you could forgive her? Donna asked. Forgive her? For cheating on me throughout our entire marriage? Clearly I'm not enough for her, and that's never going to change. She says you're a great lover. She likes what you do for her. She's just wired wrong. Maybe you could see a marriage counselor or agree to an open marriage. Enough, Donna, I said. This is his decision. I turned to him. If there's anything we can do to help, just let us know. I'll hold off on any actions until you decide. You don't deserve any of this. His eyes were red as he stared into his glass. I'm such an idiot. I thought we had a great marriage.
I really did. She's a wonderful mother and the most sexual, loving woman I've ever met. I guess that's the problem, isn't it? I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry you had to hear this from us, I said. No, it's not your fault. I'm sorry my cheating wife almost took your woman with her. He took a big gulp from his glass. Do you know any good divorce lawyers, by the way? I shook my head. I can't help you there. I would never get divorced, and I wouldn't let this happen. I'm not wired that way. I turned to my wife. I suppose you might know one. She blushed. I have a card if you want me to give it to you. Honestly, I was annoyed. Why don't you just do it? I doubt you'll ever need it. She shook her head. No, sorry, just a minute. She returned with the card. I got it from Karen. He's supposed to be the best. You should call him before she does. Did she sleep with him? Jerome asked. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Jerome replied. Great, just freaking great. He finished his drink, placing the empty glass on the table. Sorry for the intrusion. I'd say it was fun, but that would be a lie, wouldn't it? It was enlightening, I said. Donna stood up and hugged him. I'm so sorry, Jerome. She really loves you. She still loves you. She's just broken. If you had that in your heart, maybe you could heal her. I don't understand how, he said. Thanks for the drink. Anytime. If you ever need someone to talk to, don't hesitate to call, okay? I said. Thanks. I'll keep that in mind. As he left, I stared at my wife. Wow, you've got the card of the best divorce lawyer in town, I remarked. She blushed. I'm sorry, I never thought I'd use it. Can we please just forget about it? It's in the past, right? I sank heavily into my chair and took a sip. Doesn't matter. Your best friend was quite the nympho, huh? I said. She sat down next to me, moving closer. At that moment, I didn't feel particularly romantic, but I didn't shy away from her either. I think she was a full-blown nymphomaniac. They had a great sex life, but it was never enough for her. She was always chasing the next great lay. I never thought it would affect me. We were completely different. For me, intimacy matters. That's why I never cheated on you, even when I considered leaving. We never talked about this. You say you never had intimacy, but I imagine you did more than just hold hands, I said. Do you really need to know all this? I'll tell you everything if you want. Is it enough to know that I never had intimacy? I, I couldn't do that to you while we were married. Believe it or not, but I took my vows seriously. Kissing, touching, feeling, fingering, hand jobs, I pressed. I did things I'm ashamed of. I let him take liberties he should never have had, but I didn't love him. But you were ready to give up on our marriage, I reminded her. I thought I wanted something new, something different. I let him convince me that I deserved it. Just a break to figure things out for myself. It wasn't out of love for him. It's hard to believe now that I could have ever thought that way. I don't know what was going on in my head. Maybe I should see a psychiatrist. I don't even recognize the person I was becoming. She rested her head on my shoulder. I didn't open the gates. They weren't locked, and I let him squeeze his way in little by little without even realizing he was doing it, building tiny walls between you and me with his little comments. I never saw it coming. I'm so ashamed. You deserve better. I wrapped my arm around her, pulling her close. I bet you won't let that happen again. First time someone tempted you besides me. She nodded. Never. I've learned my lesson. If anyone even thinks about that crap, I'll see it coming a mile away. I lifted her chin and gently kissed her. Some reinforcement wouldn't hurt right now, I said. She smiled. The kids? We won't be long. In a hurry. For today. I'll make it up to you later. She kissed me again, smiling broadly. No way. I'm still the one playing catch-up. That works for me. Gerald was charged. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to probation. Damn, it was too easy on him, I thought. He was also issued a restraining order to stay away from my family. I kept tabs on him, even hired a couple of my colleagues, detectives a couple of times. He was in the midst of a messy divorce and ended up in the hospital eventually. I didn't beat him up, although I'll admit I had thoughts. I guess one of the other husbands didn't take his shenanigans lightly either. 
I was questioned about it, but I had an alibi stronger than most. Lucky break. Dinner at the restaurant with Jill and her husband Roger, with about a hundred witnesses and surveillance footage. The police only asked once. I had mixed feelings. I wanted to get that kind of revenge up close and personal, now the risk involved was much higher. On the other hand, it seemed like he got a serious ass-kicking with broken ribs and severely bruised balls. I backed off for now. As they say, revenge is a dish best served cold. Karen and Jerome have split up. She's seeing a psychiatrist, and they both attend marriage counseling. I don't know how he does it, living with what she's done to their marriage. I've set aside another revenge against her, at least for now. Losing her best friend, most of their mutual friends, and the state of their marriage have taken a toll on her. She's gained weight. Jerome is paying for her apartment and giving her money to live on. We talk regularly, and he comes over for dinner at least once every couple of weeks. He makes sure Karen knows too. According to Jerome, she hasn't been with anyone since he served her with divorce papers. Maybe it was the wake-up call she needed. He's still not sure if he's going to see it through to the end. I think love is a pretty strong thing. Whether it's trying to win her back or the medication the doctors have her on, she's at least pretending to be faithful. Personally, I don't think it will last long. As for Donna and me, our marital home is stronger than ever. She's still determined to make amends with me. I still have trust issues, but I try not to bring it up with her. I check her emails and GPS logs less frequently, but diligently. I don't jump to conclusions, and so far, all the deviations have been false alarms. She has a job, she works at the children's hospital and seems to enjoy it, and her work is going very well. Money isn't an issue, and the time spent hasn't interfered with our lives yet. We have our date nights, and I'll never forget how close we were to losing it all. I'll fight for our marriage like a damn cornered badger, and I still do. I make sure she knows how important she is, and we always make time for us. It's working. Will I ever stop checking on her? Fully trusting her? Maybe with time. For now, it's enough to know she loves me, is in love with me, and is absolutely faithful. We even talk about adding an extension to our home. At only 31 and constantly working with kids, she talks about having another one. Honestly, I think it would be too much for me. But I'm inclined to agree if it's what she wants. I wouldn't mind having a son. I'm also thinking about adding a moat and a second set of gates to our home. She wants it to be a mansion. I think it's more like a castle, with a thirty-foot wall six feet thick and arrow slits all around. Boiling oil pots on the battlements, ready to destroy any invaders. Hopefully I'll never need them. But never doubt, I'll fight and kill if I have to for our marriage. By the way, it's been three months since anyone heard from that bastard. Rumor has it since losing his job, wife, and reputation, he's gone. I accidentally found out he never made it past the abandoned quarry eleven miles west of here. He should have known better than to try to contact my wife again. He was warned. I was very glad to hear his ex got remarried a year after the divorce. I love the collateral damage. Regarding Karen, we'll wait and see. If Jerome takes her back and she behaves herself, maybe I'll let it go. Like I said, I like Jerome always have. If she doesn't, I'm patient.